Um, uh, let, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a pause on our content for today, hoping that towards the end of our class together we can get to that. But I want us to do something more practical in our study to get today. All right? So um, if you don't get the notes, we'll, we can continue that anytime but, um, that we are able to. But I want us to do more practical because it will help you because actually in your ministry or so on, you will need to use the practical tools, right? So want to look, want to do a little bit of study. Let's, we might not read a lot, of, a lot of the content of that, but maybe just a few verses from that. But let's, let's turn our Bibles to Jude. Jude. J-U-D-E. Jude. Jude. Yes. <laughs> Jude, yes. If you are in Genesis, do not be dis- just don't be discouraged, okay? Don't be just keep flipping your pages. I can assure you that before we leave this hall, you are going to get Jude. <laughs> yeah. Just continue. Just continue. You will reach. If you find yourself in, Reve- in Exodus, you are still on the right track. Just keep flipping. Just keep. Before we say amen in this class, you will get to Jude. <laughs> I can assure you that. <laughs> All right. Okay, Jude chapter Jude is, Jude is just one. It's just one one chapter in, 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 in it's a one chapter book, right? So it's just a very um, short short book, but it's a nice book um, for us to look at. All right, just a bit of background information though is that um, actually. Okay, so we did not even talk about this anyway. Yes. All right, so let's come to our little book study of Jude and try to see uh, how we can look at a few things in that and and then also be able to learn a few lessons that we can learn and then we'll move from there. All right. Just, um, all right. So we have the book of, of Jude. For your information, um, Jude, in English we call it Jude, right? But it could equally, this same book could be equally called the book of Judas. Because in English it's Jude. In Greek, is Judas. It's actually something like I O U D A S. That's how it will be spelled out in the, in the in the Greek translation. All right. But it appears to me though that you know, do you know before before um, before the death of Jesus, there used to be children called Judas. All right. They used to call him Judas, Judas this and Judas that. But after Ascariot misbehaved, Judas Ascariot. From that point henceforth, the name Judas became a very bad name. Nobody wants to call their child Judas anymore again. <laughs> All right? Because it has a very negative connotation. But prior to that, Judas was a very common name in Israel. All right? And then you also have Judah, which is praise. Okay, Judas means Yes. So this is Jude. All right? The name is of the book is called Jude. But this is an interesting book, though, is that uh, if you... If we uh, look into, into the book, we will see that uh, some very important fact that we'll get to know about this book is... Let's read maybe Jude chapter 1. Okay. Jude, Jude 1, 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. How does Jude introduce himself? He, so the first thing we see in this book here is what? Who? The first, no, the first thing we see in the book is what? We, we know who is the author of the book. Jude. Automatically, right? We don't need to go to Jerusalem to know the author. We can find the author right in the book here. Who is the author of the book? It is Jude. Jude or Judas is the author of the book. Same person. So we see here, he presents himself in the book. Is that clear? And and how does he present himself? As what? A servant 
Do, do we all have seven in our translation? Mine says slave. slave. That is the right word. A slave is the right word. All right, or better put, a bond servant. All right, and the idea of, of a slave, and actually uh, the, the, the Greek word here is, is what is called doulos. I remember many years ago, there used to be a ship called doulos, and there was another called logos. Logos used to go from place to place selling Christian books. And there was also another ship called Dulos. When they used to move, it was both mainly Christian ship. All right? They used to just have Christian materials and that. But Dulos or Duloi, a bond servant, it means what? A bond servant. But a servant or a, sla or a slave who is not necessarily a slave because someone makes him a slave, but is a slave of based on his voluntary well, all right? So he makes himself a slave willingly. You understand in those days, the, the idea of slavery was a very prominent idea in, um, in, the, in Israel and all of that. And it's not that slavery was anything good, but it was a very recurrent practice. And people had slaves. So Jews said, I am not actually a slave of the word, but I was a slave of who? Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. It's important to it's very important to understand though that Jude is considering himself as a born servant or a born slave of Jesus Christ. It's very important, a very important idea for us to get to know. Just to give you a little bit of a background of Jude. Do you know who was Jude? The brother of who? James. The brother of James. Good point. Because our text tells us that, right? Jude is number one. The brother of James. brother of who? James. We'll come back to James a bit. But who is Jew again? Hmm? He's also the half brother of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Jude is the half brother of Jesus Christ. Jude, I'm not just saying things to speculate, okay? I'm telling you real fact, actual true story. Jude is the brother of James. Let, let me just put it this way. If Jude is the brother of James, and James is the half-brother of Jesus, then who is Jude to Jesus? Yeah, brother to Jesus. Do you know that James was actually the brother of Jesus, the half-brother? Yeah. yeah. Do you know that? Is it a clear, established fact? Yeah. For us that Jude, James was... A half brother of Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right? But just like Jude and the others, they did not believe in Jesus until. when he was on this earth. They did not believe until he was gone. when he was gone, when he was killed. <laughs> Do you get that? And let me, that's why I, that, that's why the verse that says that a prophet is not respected in his own country, his own home. That verse can be very true. At times, sometimes that. Like even like they will look at you and say, "We know, but we know you all along your life. You grew up here, you know. You, you, you were a little boy. You used to be running in the dust here. We know you. So what can you tell us now that you are a man of God or you are a woman of God? We have always known you, right? All right. So it's it's like one of the greatest challenges you have to to encounter in your life and your ministry is to make your own family believe that God has really called you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Because you we know. You, 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 we used to know your girlfriend or your boyfriends or your, your past life. We know it. We, we know who you were. No, you, you come and tell us that. <laughs> no. Who you were? They don't have that eyes to see you as who God has made you or who you have become. So if there is the, the greatest fight you overcome in your life first, if you can overcome that fight now, then we know that you are on the track of the ministries. To overcome that your own family will believe in you. Alright? Even like, for example, if you are a husband or a wife, for you have to make your wife to believe that God has really called you. Or, or if you are called, if the woman is called, she needs the husband needs to get to the point of believing. Because I know this one. I know his weakness. I know this is her weakness. I know how she, this and that. And sometimes they just look on the physical side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm having that problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would send them videos mm -hmm. and they just 
generational style. Mm-hmm. You know, and nobody comments. Mm-hmm. They don't comment. They don't say, God bless you, nothing. And mm-hmm. it's so hard to, you know, mm-hmm. accept. So I'm going through it now. Mm-hmm. I don't even say anything about the message. Most so important thing. Notice. Most important thing. Stay focused. Yeah. All right? Don't bother. Yeah, it will take time. Mm-hmm. But stay focused. Stay concentrated on God's call for your life. Mm-hmm. Stay on that. All right? Let me tell you, like, from 1993, I knew that God wanted me to serve him. From 1993. I was still young, a very young, young person at the time. But everyone asked, what do you want to become? I want to be a servant of God. And for me, a servant of God at the time was to become a Catholic priest. I wanted to be a Catholic priest. So when I grew up, when I got to like grade 11, they put my name on the roster that, from grade 8, in fact, they put my name on the roster that. By the time he gets to grade 12, after he graduates, he's going straight to the seminary. The only person that did not make this to come to pass was my mother. She had to take me from that city, from that whole country, and take me to a different country. <laughs> That's the only reason why today I'm not a Catholic priest. But in all of that, it was God's sovereign plan. I'm, I'm glad that I'm not a Catholic priest today, though. I'm glad I'm following God in this direction here. All right? But if it was not God had, had used my mother, I would have been a Catholic priest today. Because we were three, the two others went to seminary, to the Catholic seminary. But is it easy to bring them from there? Mm? No. Don't even try. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. It's, it's yeah. easier to bring them from there. Well, like, like, like for, for the, the two of them went to the seminary. What happened? Both of them eventually, one of them got involved in sexual immorality, and they chased him out. The other, the conditions of study was very hard for him, and he left. All right? He left and eventually went into medicine. He's still involved a lot in the Catholic Church, but he could not withstand the, 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 the learning. Because it takes a lot of learning. Yeah. All right? Do you understand that? That is why when somebody just says, I want to become a, I want to become a pastor. It, yes, it's not the uh, Bible school that makes you a pastor, but you need to study also. You need to put time to it. And take Bible school very serious. Because like most of most priests have at least a master's degree. Most priests. That means that if somebody's a priest, just know that that person has at least a master's degree. Yeah. Or a doctorate in philosophy. <laughs> Do you understand that? Yeah, well, so they don't just come to you and talk to you like you see them, you see them wearing that white cloth like a foolish person. That person has at least it may be like philosophy, might be like a wordly. That is why, like in my country, for example, something like sociology, physiology, psychology were only taught by priests or sisters. Because they were the ones who were trained in that discipline. No, you could not have anyone else be, be trained in that. Now we are going, we are we are going off, off, off all of our conversation. Let's come back to what we should look at, right? We're coming back to, to, to James. James says here, let's read please Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And Mark, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. Matthew chapter 13. But keep your hands in Jude because we are coming back. I just want to give you a reference. Matthew 13, 55, or Mark chapter 6. If you have Mark, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Yes? So, isn't this the carpenter's son? Mm-hmm. Isn't his mother called Mary? Yes. His brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Do you hear that? Who are they referring to? Jesus. Jesus. Is this not who? The brothers of James, Joseph, yeah. Simon, and Judas. Yes, before we come to that, but the first portion says, well, is this not the... So for them, you see, what I was just talking right now, yeah. do you see that? Yeah, even Jesus had to overcome that reality. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> he came and said to them, I'm, I'm God. I'm a, I'm, a man, I'm a man of God. <laughs> Is this not a carpenter's son? Mm-hmm. For them to accept Jesus as a carpenter's son. All right. But to accept him as a man of God is a different thing. Is this not a carpenter's son? Is this not? Now let's look at the second portion here, which is actually this scripture interpret scripture. That's a basic rule of biblical interpretation. Scripture interprets scripture. It's a basic rule, a basic hermeneutical principle that every scripture, there is another verse that will help to interpret that scripture that you are reading. The difficulty you will have in your life is to find that verse that will help you interpret that other verse. That's a challenge. If you find it, your life is easy. If you don't find it, then keep checking until you find it. But scripture always interprets scripture. So, 
They say here, yeah, number one, is this not the capital song? But number two is the most important part that I want us to get. Are not his brothers? What's, what are the names of the brothers here of Jesus? James. Number one is James. Number two is who? James and John. The text, no, let's read the text. Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Joseph? Simon. Simon? And who? Judas. This Judas here is this Jew that we are talking about here. Do you understand that? The Judas that they are asking him here. Look, I don't like bringing meaning from outside of anywhere. I think there is a lot of meaning the test can give us that we just have to read it. Since what are this, these are so like some people believe. I know that some people believe that Mary never had another husband. She did not have children, or she did not have other people, or Jesus did not have brothers. Some people believe that. That's a wrong teaching. Today, the scripture is telling us here that what there was James, there is Joseph, there is Simon, there is Judas, and he even has sisters. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. Do you understand that? So the next time somebody comes to you and tell you that maybe never had all that children, just tell them that please don't 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 mess it up in the Bible. The Bible is clear. Uh, the Bible is clear on the subject. There is no conversation on that matter. It's said the Bible says what? He had James, he had Joseph, he had Simon. And then you also see he had also what? Judas. There are two of them who are most prominent in the Bible. Judas or Jew is prominent. And we also have James. Who was James? The one they killed, the pastor they killed. Mm-hmm. Who was James in the church of the uh, who in the history of the early church? Who was James? Hmm? He was a pastor. He was a pastor, yes. Who was he? James? And of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not James? <laughs> <laughs> she's going to she's reading James now. She's going to look up. Who is James? <laughs> James. James. Okay, just for time, right? James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. James was what? The pastor of the headquarter of Christianity. The one who was in charge of all Christian churches that we ever because the church started from Jerusalem, right? The part the one who was pastoring the church in Jerusalem when the church started, his name is James. He was the brother of Jesus Christ. So that was our first pastor. Yes, James. Philip it wasn't Peter who was the first pastor. It was James. Philip the first evangelist. James. James the first pastor. All right. Do you get that? Acts chapter fifteen, verse thirteen. Acts fifteen, thirteen. Can we read that, please? Acts chapter 15, verse 13. Samuel, do you want to preach also? Or do you want to teach? <laughs> Acts chapter 15, verse 13. Can somebody please read that for me? If you have that. Yes, Acts 1, 5, 13. And after they had held their peace, mm-hmm. James answered, saying, mm-hmm. Men and men, mm-hmm. I can answer you. Mm-hmm. Simon has declared how God mm-hmm. the first did Visit the mm-hmm. to take out to take out of them a people for his name, mm-hmm. and to this agree the words of the prophet. Okay. As it is written. Mm-hmm. After this, I will return and okay. we will build a man. Okay. The of the All right. So here now, Simon is that is Simon Peter. You all you all agree with that, right? Mm-hmm. Simon Peter brings a report back to the believers in Jerusalem because they were rebuking Simon. Why did you have to go to unbelievers? Yeah. And more specifically, who was Simon? Who did Simon go to specifically? Cornelius. Cornelius. Yeah. You remember that story? Yeah. Cornelius, right? Yeah. Yes. The, 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 that he had, right? And then Simon was arguing with the, with the Lord that I cannot go and eat an unclean animal and the rest of that. And then the Lord eventually... Say whatever I call clean, don't call it unclean. Do you get that? So now Simon now they were they were in fact accusing him that he has broken, he has done something that is unheard of. Because for the Jews, they believe that Christianity should just have been a religion for the Jews. They do not need to go out. So Simon now come back to Jerusalem to the headquarter church 
to bring the report to them. And it requires someone to defend him so that the believers, he told them, God has done it, God has done it, God has done it, God has done all of this. But now, James, who is the pastor of the church, is going to give the final saying that, look, we have to believe what Simon said. Because of what verse 13 says, what? And after they had heard that peace. Yes, after they have heard that peace. James answered. Saying, James is answering now on behalf of the church. Men and brethren. Men and brethren. Yes. Simon has declared how God at the first yes. did visit the Gentiles yes. to take out of them yes. the people for, for himself. Them. Do you understand that? So he said, don't argue about go, salvation going to the gent Gentiles so because God himself had decided to visit them. So the pastor of the church in Jerusalem now had to make the whole church to believe that what Simon has done was correct. Do you understand that? Do we get that? So we, we, from this class, we leave for the understanding that, number one, James was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. All right? Or Jerusalem. He's the pastor of the church, the first pastor of the church. Of, of, if they ask you a, a Bible question, if you go to your Bible quote, they ask you, who is the first pastor of the church of Christianity? Tell them, apart from Jesus Christ, the first human pastor is what? It's James. He was the first pastor in the church that we ever know. Do you understand that? James was the brother of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 7 verse 5, the Bible tells us that the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. Is that not so? Yeah. It is so, right? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it's verse 7, where Paul is going to account, give a defense of the resurrection. He says when he appeared to who? James. Yes. yes. Not so. Can we read that first? Coronto chapter 15. 15 verse, verse 7. 7. 1 Coronto. First Corinthians. After that, he was seen of James. He was seen of who? Then of all the of James. Yes. Then of all the apostles. All the apostles. Uh, first Corinthians. Chapter 15, 15. Verse 7. Yeah. After these things, Jesus Christ appeared first to to James, then he was saved by the other apostles. He appeared first to He believed that when Jesus died, then the brothers really put their trust in him before he resurrected. He was saved first by James. But we understand that actually it wasn't a man who saw Jesus first. It was the ladies who saw him first. The guys were still sleeping, right? Yes. They were afraid of the cold that time. I'm just adding my mind to it. <laughs> 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 all right, but, but it's clear, all right. But it was a patriarchal um, environment where the, the system of patriarchy placed high emphasis on men than on women. So, here now, Paul is narrating that Jesus appeared first to James. Then he appeared to the apostles. Then he appeared also to me. Do you see? We are just still in James chapter 1 verse 1, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to understand it. Do you get that? Jude. Jude. Oh, sorry, Jude. Jude chapter 1. Where he says what? Jude, he is a born servant. So you see this Jude here now? He doesn't, Jude could have come here and grab that I drew the brother of Jesus Christ. He could have done that. He had a legitimate right here to do it because he was the half brother of Jesus Christ. He could have done that, right? But he doesn't consider himself. Now he has a proper understanding of who Jesus is. He doesn't consider himself necessarily based on his brother relationship with Jesus Christ, but he considers Jesus Christ as what? His Lord. Because, because he is a slave to Jesus Christ. Jesus is master and his Lord. Do you see that? Do you get that? He is a slave to his brother. His brother is his master. He's a slave. Do you get that? Very important concept. He understands that. No, this is not about just family relationship here. There is a higher dimension of a relationship here. Which is the relationship of master and slave here. I, I, it is not because my brother wants me to become a, a, a slave, but I willingly choose to become a slave yeah. to him. Do you get that? Can I ask a question? 
Yes. Yes. Now you have just put the question mark in my head. Yes. You say Jesus appeared first to James. Yes. Yes. But in the encounters here, yes. we see that Marie, Marie Magdalene yes. went to the tomb. Yes. If we, re we remove Marie Magdalene, we will see Peter and John. Yes. Now, when did Jesus appear to James? They did not see Jesus. Mm. When they were to see that because mm -hmm. we just read it, right? Yes. I want to know when exactly can you that? Yes. So here we see that as I, as I say, when we read the scripture, the Bible says what? It was the ladies who went first to what? The tomb. To the tomb, right? When they went to the tomb, who did the ladies meet? There was a man. Yes. A yeah, man? Mm -hmm. There's a man there. They thought it was a gardener. It was a gardener. Yeah. And they had to ask him, where, where, have, you where have you left him? Let him. And then what did the man say? He said, he is no more here. Mm -hmm. He has risen. He has risen. And what happened there? Go and tell the brothers. Go and tell the brothers. But she wasn't separate. Mm? She, she he did not reveal himself. Yes, yeah. to her, yes. But he revealed himself to, to, to Mary. He revealed himself to James. Right. So, but but this is what I'm saying. This is this. I don't see it. That's why I'm asking. Do you remember? Do you remember what we said? Do you remember what we just said a few minutes ago? Do you remember what we just said a few seconds ago? Scripture interpret scriptures. Do you get that? Some details that are not explicitly indicated here in the gospel. How do we understand it? When we look to the pieces. Do you get that? Sometimes it may be explicitly clear in the gospel. Sometimes we need to look outside of the gospel into the pieces to understand it. Do you understand that? So that's why, even when I talk about the issue of Corinthians, we all know, for example, based on the Corinthian fact that it was the lady who had confessed. And even that angel, some believe it was just an angel, others believe it was actually Jesus who had appeared. But, yet as the Bible tells us here, now Paul here is concluding and saying that what? He appeared to James, then he appeared to the other apostles, then he appeared also unto me. And you agree with me that James, because James did not believe in Jesus Christ, James was also not a part of the 12 apostles. Because he did not believe in, in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? I don't understand it. He, because he wasn't, he, he believed in Jesus only after his resurrection. Jesus appeared to his apostles here. All right, but does anywhere in the New Testament tell that Jesus appeared to other people before he appeared to the apostles? Apart from, does anywhere in the Scripture tell us that? But when we get to in the in the Gospel, I mean, but when we get to read, we we'll see here actually he appeared to to James. Do you get that? Let me tell you another thing here is that. Do you know that even when Jesus died, between the time that he died and the time he resurrected, do you know that Jesus was performing other works? Other actions? Do you know that? Between his death and his resurrection. What did the Bible say? He went to? Yes, to go and do what? The keys. Take the keys and preach the gospel. Like Abraham, Isaac, all these people, they were not yet in heaven. All right? Which is... It's a whole di different uh, doctrine that I don't know. Even we don't even have to even, even talk when about. He died, yes. That time he died. Yes. Many tombs were open. Open, and they went into the city. Went into the city. To go and proclaim. Do you read that? Have you read that in your Bible before? Yeah. I've read that. Somewhere. All right. Yeah. All right. So then the question is, how do we reconcile with? It is appointed unto man once to die after that to cast judgment. How to reconcile the scriptures together? I'm not going to do reconciliation today here about that scripture. Let's leave it, okay? But I just want you to know it, by the way. Can we come back to our scripture here otherwise? Yes. <laughs> we, we won't be able to, <laughs> to leave from here. All right? So he considers himself here. He says, He's a born servant of Jesus Christ, and he is the brother of James. All right? And then he says here now, who is he going to write? Who is this book of, J or, of Jude going to be written to? He says, To all. Those who are what? Those who are sanctified. Yes. 
Yes. And preserved. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. So here, actually, this book of this book of Jude or this book of, 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 of uh, that we're going to read is considered to be actually preached like a sermon. It's considered like it is believed that it is an it, it was a, a, an epistolary sermon that Jude was actually preaching a message. And the main message of this Bible, which we are going to look at maybe shortly, is actually about contending for the faith or defending the faith. That's the main message. That we have to contend for the faith. And then he talks a lot about the whole idea of apostasy. Hmm? You know what that word means, right? Apostasy. A P O S T A. Apostasy. What does it mean? Yes. They used to believe before. But they are falling away. All right, that's in the book of Jude. One of the most difficult things that we have to, or one of the the underlying messages that we have to to wrestle with a lot is what is the issue of what of apostasy. Those who used to believe in Jesus Christ, no, but they have what Sleeping. turn away. Let me let me let me warn you though. Let me, let me share this so with the you. Is for the faith. Yes. All right? But let me, let, me, let me just give this as a warning to everyone in the class, though, is that the, when it comes to salvation, all right, there are two broad views that you encounter in almost every church or in, in the evangelical community. Two broad schools of thoughts that you encounter when we we'll talk about salvation. The first group of people are those whom we call the Calvinists. Do you get that? C A L V I N I S T. And the Calvinists form their line of theology from a man, one of the reformers, his name was called John. Calvin. All right? John Calvin. And, and the whole idea, do you get that? So there are going to be, even salvation Christianity, in the, in the most, in the broad evangelical talk, when even we talk about salvation or other things, you will find two lines of, of thought. Two lines. All right, of argument. The first line is what? Those who hold on to a Calvinistic theology of Christianity. All right? They, are, they call themselves Calvinist. All right? Do you get that? And it comes from the day are of the, 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 the mainly go by the, the ideology of John Calvin. Do you understand that? And under that, there is what we often used to use. Uh, it's been, it's been a few years I haven't taught this. <laughs> and I did not plan to teach it today, actually. <laughs> but, but I just remember that and I just want to share it with you. All right? Just to so help. But, but uh, they, they are basically, they basically surround on what we call T U L I P. Tulip. All right? Calvinism is basically based on, on this five principles. There are five main principles of Calvinism. All right, and often it's used. Um, T U L I P is used to defend the five main thoughts of Calvinism. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Yes. All right. All right. Do you understand? So the first group is. Those who we call the what? The Calvinist. The Calvinist. And even, even I'm going to give you the second one now. But let's just. We are, we are going to come to that also.
All right. So let me summarize first. What does carbon? The main. This is like the main defense or the main argument of carbonism. It's a good teaching, so I should enjoy the water. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a, it's a nice teaching. So I should enjoy the water. Alright? So, Calvinism is based on the idea, most Calvinists say that once you are saved, you are always saved forever. You can never lose your salvation. There's so much debate over this Yes. Alright? It says what? Once you are saved, always saved. You can never, always, you are always saved. You will never ever lose your salvation. That's, that's like the overlying, I'm just trying to simplify it here, right? It's the over, that's the main concept of Calvinism. That, because, the, and the scripture that is used often here, one of the greatest scripture of, of the Calvinists is in John. Is it John chapter 6 or John chapter 7? I don't, I'm not sure. You can check that on your own. Where, Jesus, where the Father says what? Who, whoever, Jesus says, whoever the Father has given to me, they shall never be snatched from my hands. That if somebody is saved, there is no way that you can be snatched out of the hands of God. Do you get that? Do you understand that? I'm not here to promote Calvinism or Arminianism. You will form your own thought on which one you believe in or hold on to. And I'm not here to even persuade you about any of the two. And I understand that I'm not going to go into so much of conversation of Calvinism or so on, but I'm just trying to give you a general idea about that. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So let's come to, to two things. Number one is what? This is, Calvinists believe that, number one, there is total depravity. How do we even get to this place that we are now? What brought us here? <laughs> I have no idea how we landed here. Salvation. <laughs> okay. Salvation, right? <laughs> All right. But we had first we talked about the apostles. <laughs> okay. Yeah, apostles. Okay. Yes, this is what brought us here. This is what brought apostles. Is what brought us here because this was not part of our class, though. So I'm wondering how do we how do we learn in this? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's interesting, right? So they believe in the total depravity of mankind. That man is 100% deprived, all right? Man cannot be able to be, to, to, to be saved on his own. Man is completely depraved. Man has a depraved mind. There is no way that man can please God. No way that man can be holy. No way that man can meet the requirement. There is absolutely nothing that man can do that will ever meet the standards of God on his own. Do you understand that? It's impossible on your own to meet the standard of God. And number two, the number one is what? Total. Number two is what we call the un. Conditional election. Unconditional what? Election. Election. Let me also tell you that the idea or the concept of election is one that is also very disputable. Do you get that? Election. What is it? If you read Romans, you get an idea. Well, I wish we could maybe have a, just a class on talking about this. But we're just taking two minutes or, two, or three minutes to talk about it. So don't leave from here and go and, and feel that you have formed all your theology on that. Maybe go and study on your own, or maybe we'll have time, we can have conversation on that. All right? Okay? So, like the idea, some people say that the idea of election is that I have there are two thoughts. Is that the number one is that the elect, those who are saved, all right? They say that some people believe that there are certain people. No matter what they do to become saved, they will never be saved. Because they are not part of the elect. Some people believe there is a specific class of people who are elect. That no matter what, if you are not part of that class, don't waste your time, you'll never be elect. 
There's a class of people that believe that. Others believe that the elect actually refers to whoever puts their trust in Jesus Christ, they form part of this elect group. Do you understand that? So you even in the issue of election, you may find these two major conversations going on. Here. One person to make it easy either. All right. When from two brothers. Yes. He, he yes. The, the story of Esau and Jacob is it comes in. That's that's like the, the, the a major verse on election is what? So, is that Esau and Jacob. Esau have uh, uh, sorry, Jacob have a uh, and Esau have a Alright? So that is the, then it comes to Romans also. But I'm not I'm telling you, I'm not doing any justice to the passage at all. So just understand like that. Alright? So there is the unconditional put A L here, sorry. Unconditional election. That there is no condition that you can meet on your own to be saved. That it is a free, unconditional, unmerited favor. Number three is what we call the limited atonement. Limited atonement simply means that to so atone means was the price that Jesus paid for us, right? All right? It's the price that he paid on the cross for us. But the limited atonement, the ideology here is that this blood of Jesus that was shared on the cross of Calvary is some people they argue here, even in the concept of limited atonement, that the blood is just for few people who are going to be saved. Others say that the blood is only effective in the lives of those who accept and respond to that call of salvation. Do you understand that? So each of these have their own sub conversations that we cannot have now because of time. All right, but the limited atonement here is that even though Jesus died, but the actual work of Jesus is only effected in the life of a limited group of people. But then it would negate uh, John three sixteen. Mm-hmm. That 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 thing. The, the whole song. Negate John three sixteen. Not necessarily because the limited group of people are the whoever. The song three. Yes. So then, we, so this argument is that, and, and to, so to an extent, there are two conversations on this here, two sides of thought, right? But like when it comes to issue on the limited atonement, is that this is that the blood of Jesus, even though the blood of Jesus is for everybody, but who enjoy it? Only those who are those saved, who those who respond to it. Do you understand that? Yeah. Is it clear a little bit? Mm-hmm. I know some of you are confused now. <laughs> enjoy my confusion with me. No. All right, but it's like. The limited atonement, like they are a line that says that no, the blood of Jesus for few people, but the second group of people, which I think is more balanced, is that the Jesus, even though Jesus died for the whole world, but the blood of Jesus is only effected in the life of those who respond to that. If you don't respond to the blood of Jesus, you cannot enjoy the blessings attached to the blood of Jesus. Do you get that? I, at least that line of thought, I agree with that line of, of teaching. Okay? All right. And then, number. Number four is what we call the irresistible grace. That the grace of God, God is going to find you at all costs. Even if you like, if God wants to get you, you like going and be the worst criminal in the world. But at some point, you cannot resist the grace of God. Do you get that? You cannot resist the grace of God. And the last group here now is the last here is the Perseverance of the saints. And this is where now they believe that the saints, when you when you are saved, you will persevere, continue in Jesus. You will continue living for Jesus until he comes. Do you understand that? So you persevere in your work with Christ. So every church holds onto one of these two, either Calvinist or the next one. Do you understand at least a little bit of Calvinism? Do you understand? Most capitalism is based on these five points. You will hear people say, I'm a five-point capitalist. I believe in all these five points. So I will tell you, I'm a three-point capitalist. At least, let me just say, by the way, that at least all believers are three-point capitalists. All believers, at least you are three-point capitalists. Number one, you believe in, at least that, you believe that man, all have seen the foundation of the glory of God. Everyone believes in that one. Two of us. Yeah, true. true. You may believe that, um, for example, but I don't believe because on the first one you said that other than believing that we we all all human beings uh, mm-hmm. have fallen short of the 
glory of God, mm -hmm. you said also that it's impossible for Mary to be holy, you know? On his own. On his own. Yes. Yeah. True. You need God. Exactly. All right? So at least, like, most people believe in this, in this, or in this, or in this. But most people will say I'm three point, some will say I'm four point. But the, but the most thing about happiness are the five point happiness. These are the most. These are the ones that you can, you will talk and talk and talk and talk. See, I'm a five point Catholic. Is the word a saint? Huh? Perseverance of the saints. Saint. Yes, S A I N T. I think I should have just gone to do medicine. That would be helpful because I write like a doctor at times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The second group is what is the Armenian. <laughs> oh, you got Armenianism. Also, John Armenian. And this group believe that you may be saved today, you can lose your salvation tomorrow or the day after. Oh, yeah. If you don't work with God. Alright? Okay? Most, from my observation, most Pentecostals are Armenian. Not all. Most Pentecostals are Armenian. Most conservative evangelicals are Calvinists. John Armenian, he had the same thing he said of Calvinists, but if you John Armenian also had several issues of theological beliefs that that were actually not accurate if you read about him or so on. But most people hold on to um, Ar Ar Armenianism, but the main thing about Armenianism is that I'm not going to go so much into emphasizing, but the main thing is that if you are safe today, there's a possibility of you losing your salvation. I am neither a Calvinist nor an Armenian. I just believe in the Bible. <laughs> Alright? Alright? There are some truths in Calvinism I hold on to. Alright? There are some truths also in Armenianism that I hold on to. By the end of the day, I made up my mind many years ago that I'm not going to be on any of this camp here. Because I, sometimes it force you to, you have to just make your theology in a way that will defend one point. I rather allow the Bible to speak for itself. Do you get that? Yeah. But when you leave from here, you go out, you will hear this conversation all over. Mm -hmm. It's and they might not call these things, but that is it. Someone say, no, you won't say what was it. No, 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 no. And there is so much argument about that. But you have to just be able to. And this even the, when we talk about the issue of apostasy. And even when you for me, though, I believe that there are some verses like in Hebrews that the, the Calvinists find difficult to interpret. Like for example, Hebrews chapter 6. Like they, they, the Calvinists believe that. I'm not downplaying Calvinism, all right? Like, for example, uh, my father in the law is a Calvinist. He holds on to that. He, even though he calls himself a four-point, not a five-point Calvinist, he holds on to four points. But, uh, but um, uh, um, uh, um, for example, most Calvinists believe that if somebody backslides in their faith, what we need to really understand is that that person from the beginning first, they were actually not saved. Because it's impossible that if you are truly saved, for you to backslide from your faith. Alright? Do you understand that? Then I, then I take them to that passage in Hebrews chapter 6. Is it Hebrews 6? I think so. It's already time, right? So we have to come to a close. Yes, I think it's Hebrews 6. Let me just see. I hope, I think it's that. Let me, but, uh, yes. It says what? Okay. Therefore, no, 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 so bring them back to repentance. Go ahead. Yeah, who tasted the heavenly gift. They tasted the heavenly gift. Who shared in the Holy Spirit. They shared in the Holy Spirit. Who tasted God's good word and have the power and the powers of the coming age. Tasted God's good word and the power of the coming age. Mm -hmm. That if what they do, what? Continue, please. And who have fallen away. If they fall away, continue. This is because to their own harm. Mm -hmm. They are re-crucifying the Son of God okay. and holding him up to contempt. 
All right. So here, the Bible says that those who are tasted of the power of God, tasted of the good works of God, I believe that those descriptions is acting of someone who have come to salvation. All right. It says that the, the writer of Hebrews is saying that those who have enjoyed all these things, if they fall away, it is difficult to bring them back. Very difficult passage in the Bible. And then, but the, the Calvinists will say that, no, these people that have been referred to here, they were not actually saved. They just used to go to church and just fellowship with church. And they were just part of church. And I say, I don't really believe that to be true. Because tasted of the works of the Holy Spirit, they have enjoyed the works of the coming age, they, they, to, they, they, they have also experienced, they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Can all believers be partakers of the Holy Spirit? No. I really don't believe that. Yes. Yes. And then they drive away. So I, I like, I believe that that's one of the areas that, because Calvinists, most Calvinists, not all, most Calvinists say the whole issue of backsliding is actually a true believer will not backslide. So those who backslide are not actually really truly saved. Whatever is your thought, I'm just exposing this to you. I'm not here to make you believe in any of that. All right? I'm just exposing this broad thing to you. Even as we talk about apostasy. Next week, we'll pick up just from Jude. We were still in verse 2, right? We'll pick up from, we'll read verse 2 and start from verse 2. Continue if we, if we get to meet together. May God bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this class. Thank you for your beautiful word. Thank you for everyone here today. The things that seem so clear, thank you for that. The ones that are not so clear, give us wisdom and insight into your divine word. And bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah.